everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Hat weekly Hatfield Marine Science Center um, seminar. Um, this is a hybrid event with folks attending both on site and online. Uh, Roseanne and or Rose are, are on our hybrid support today. Uh, please let them know uh, for folks online if you're having any technical issues so that they can assist or let those of us on site know. My name is Yi Chung Chung. I'm the academic program manager here at Hatfield, and I'll be the host for today's talk. For those of you online, we have your mics, cameras, and screen share off. Uh, but please uh, ask your questions either through the chat or you can raise your virtual hand and we can read it out loud at the end. Uh, same for those in the room. Please uh, raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. You can ask a question. Uh, this is re a recorded event. Um, and it will be posted on the HMSC Past Seminar page in a few days. Uh, you can also look at it on our YouTube page. Some quick announcements. Next week's seminar is Thursday, March 16th at 3.30. Same bat day, same bat time. Will be hosted by Bob Cowan. When Robin Waples uh, joins us from the University of Washington, we'll talk about on the shoulders of giants. Under Oops, nope, that's wrong. That's wrong. My apologies. Next week's HMSC Research Seminar is on Thursday, April 20th at 3.30 p.m. when Neil Thompson with uh, USDA's Agricultural Research Service here at HMSC will talk with us about bringing genomic selection into shellfish aquaculture. Another announcement also is our next Science on Tap, which is April 26th, uh, when Tom Calvinese from Port, the Port Orford Field Station and Ford Evans will talk about the impacts of the purple sea urchins uh, population dynamics on the Oregon kelp forest. Uh, there'll be a social hour that starts at five here in the uh, lobby. And then uh, the talk will start at 6 p.m. here in the auditorium and online. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, today we have Dr. Clarissa Teixeira, who is a postdoc in the school, uh, who's a postdoc scholar in the Marine Mammal Institute here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center and the OSU Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and Conservation Sciences. She's an ecologist interested in trophic ecology of marine organisms using biomarkers at the individual population and community levels to understand how intra and interspecific inter interactions can influence the food webs. Um, originally from Brazil, uh, Clarissa Teixeira is a zoologist and ecologist interested in assessing the trophic ecology of marine organisms using biomarkers at the individual, uh, yeah, repeating that. So, sorry about that. Just so you know, I really like it. <laughs> uh, she uh, got her master's and PhD at University Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina, uh, where she uh, worked on stable isotopes to tell her story on what and where marine mammals are feeding. Uh, she, so she used this method, method to disentangle the trophic ecology of St. Patrick coastal dolphins of the Brazilian coast. Uh, in 2022, with a postdoctoral fellowship by the Gray Whale License Plate, Clarissa joined the Whale Habitat Ecology and Telemetry Lab, the wet lab, in a project that combines biomarkers and tag data to assess the effects of the deep water horizon oil spill in the diet of, in the diet of Gulf of Mexico sperm whales. In a few days, Clarissa will be joining the Ocean Ecology Lab uh, for a new project with predation of salmon smolts by harbor seals that she will briefly introduce today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clarissa Teixeira. Thank you. Thank you, Yichang, for this presentation. Uh, can you hear me okay? Oops. Okay, so, uh, wow. It's really good to see you all here. Um, and this is very special. It's a special week for me because in two days, I will complete in one year here. So, yay, one year anniversary. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you so much for all these interactions in this new environment. This is very important to me and make me feel uh, at home, even not being at home. So thank you so much. And speaking of interaction, is not going. Okay, I can go. 
And speaking of interactions and the new environment, that reminds me a lot of the niche, the very abstract uh, concept of ecological niche, where we have a space or an hyper volume where these dimensions that form this volume, they represent the environmental conditions, the resources, and most importantly, the interactions, the intra and interspecific interactions that allow individuals in a population to survive, right? And by inter and interspecific interactions, I'm talking about predation, cooperation, and competition. So the niche theory predicts that coexisting species can avoid competition by partitioning their resources in three different dimensions. So they can basically eat different prey sources, but they can also eat in different periods of time or in different places. So if we quantify, it is important to quantify the trophic niche of this coexisting species, so can, we can understand what are the underlying mechanisms that are allowing these species to be in the same space. And then we can use this information to predict the responses to ecosystem changes that can, for example, uh, change the prey distribution, distribution or abundance. But we all know how hard it is. Well, most of us know how hard it is to walk, to see marine mammals in, in, in the wild, right? And it can get even harder when we want to know what or when or what or when or where they are eating. So that's one of the reasons why the most used method or approach in the last, I don't know, 15 years is the stomach contained analysis, which is basically uh, a type of method where we open the dead animal and we see what are the hard parts that resisted the digestion pr procedure and are still there. And we can get a taxonomic information about this prey source consumed. Even though it's an important process and is an important method, it also has very important limitations as all methods that we use, right? So that doesn't mean that we need to stop using stomach content analysis, right? So what we can do to make this data more accurate, right? So one of the major limitations of the stomach content data is that we have only as an assessment of the diet in a short period of time. Basically, we have a snapshot of what the animal died before, uh, of what the animal ate before he died. So we can have sick animals. We have animals that have empty stomachs or animals that regurgitate, regurgitate before they die. What if we can integrate the stomach on day data that provides taxonomic information with other methods that provide more temporal assessment of the diet? So what we can do, for example, is combine stomach, as a, stomach content data with biomarkers. And this may be a new word for uh, most of you here, but biomarkers are any elemental or molecular signatures that we can use to trace the flow of matter in the food web, uh, matter and energy through the food web. So basically with the stomach content data, we have uh, what the animal ate and we can see, but with biomarkers, what we can see is the signature of the animal, what you assimilated and is in your tissues, right? So here I just put some example, one example that is the stable isotope analysis. I'm going to focus on this today because it is the method that I've been using since my PhD. And with stable isotopes, we can uh, measure the occurrence of, uh, uh, of uh, natural stable isotopes in animal tissues. We can use bulk tissue, or we can analyze compound specific amino acids, for example, or fatty acids, for example. But what is stable isotope analysis? I bet that a lot of people are here because they're like, okay, what? she actually do, I, we don't know what she does. So <laughs> stable isotope analysis is based, rely on the assumption that the isotopic composition in a consumer tissues will reflect the isotopic composition of the prey sources with a small difference related to a trophic discrimination factor. And the trophic discrimination factor is a fancy name to say that is the isotopic difference before, uh, between what you eat and what you are in your tissues, right? 
So the most common stable isotopes are carbon and nitrogen because they are basically everywhere, right? Everything that we eat, everything that we touch, everything formed but carbon and nitrogen. So stable isotopes, oh, that was too fast, sorry. Uh, so stable isotopes of carbon reported as delta 13 carbon, they uh, increase zero to one parts per thousand for trophic level, so it's not too much. And they vary substantially among primary producers with different photosynthetic pathways. So now I want to go back to your plant physiology class and remember about C3 and C4 plants. So we have different portions, different amounts of carbon in these two types of plants. What does that mean? For example, there is a typical gradient between benthic and pelagic environments. So benthic environments are mostly composed of sea grasses and marsh plants, and they are C3 plants, and they are enriched in heavy carbon. When we go to pelagic environment, they are C4 plants, mostly marine uh, phytoplankton, and they are uh, depleted in heavier carbon. So what? What we can do with that, right? Well, we can, for example, analyze the carbon values that we have in different individuals in a population or in a group or in different populations or different species and see if they use coastal areas or benthic areas or more pelagic areas. So this is for the carbon. And then we have the nitrogen. And the nitrogen usually increases more protrophic level. It's usually three to five parts per thousand. And it's usually used to denote the trophic position of a predator in a food web. So the nitrogen isotope composition in a tissue will be determined by a dose that is ingested minus those that are those that is uh, excreted as byproduct of the metabolism. So that means that people are right when they say that you are what you eat, but actually you are what you eat less what you excrete, right? Oh, that should become, yeah, that was a complicated image. But the interesting thing about stable isotopes, as I say, is that we can have the assimilated diet in different periods of time. So that is the great advantage of using stable isotopes. So we can use different tissues and with using different tissues with different turnover rates that are another fancy word to say, renovation tissue at that time, right? So when we have tissues that renovate really fast, like plasma and liver, <clears throat> they will give us the diet assessment in a shorter period of time, like the last few days of the diet. But when we analyze bone tissues, for example, that have a slow turnover rate, we can see what the animal, it's a mean value of what the animal ate the entire life, right? So we can know like from years, what was the diet. But the most interesting thing in my opinion is that you can use tissues that are metabolic inert like baleen plates, uh, tooth denting, uh, earplugs, whiskers, and we can have a chronological assessment of the diet, right? Because once they are produced, they are not reabsorbed. So that means that we'll, they will continuously, continuously grow, but and you can analyze some sample that tissue and have different periods of time. Or what you can do is have different tissues in the same individual and then compare the diet between tissues. And then what we have is the isotopic niche, which is a proxy for the ecological niche, where we have this isospace and the axes that are the, uh, there are the elements, the components, that represent the resources and the habitat where the animals are using, feeding, and the prey sources, right? So we can use metrics that quantify the trophic interactions, the niche overlap between individuals, species, and populations. Okay, so now we have this ecological concepts of resource petition and competition and is a topic concepts that was too much. Okay, but then the part that really matters is how we, what, how we can use this for marine mammals, right? And we can start doing different questions. So what they are eating, are they sharing resources? Are they partitioning their resources in order to be in the same area, right? Or 
for in the case, for example, of coastal cetaceans, are they changing their diet through time due to resource fluctuation in these areas? And that is a little bit of what I did during my PhD. Uh, now we are going to warmer areas. Southern of Brazil is really warm there. Uh, <laughs> so we have this unique sympathy in Southern Brazil, the Santa Catarina state is the only place where we can find co three coastal dolphins, the Franciscana, the La Hill bottlenose dolphin and the Guiana dolphin. So meet our stars. They are pretty adorable. Uh, they have several anatomic, morphological and body dimensions that likely affect their pre preferences and their energetic demands. So what we know from these animals comes mostly from stomach content, data, stomach content data, and we know that they share several of their prey items, but we don't know for sure what is the main contribution in their diet. To, what is the contribution of these prey sources to their diet? And also if they are changing their consumption of prey sources through time because they're all coastal. So to know, to understand how, what is the contribution of these prey sources to the diet, we need to have tissues from both predators and the consumers. Uh, sorry, the consumers and the prey sources. Uh, so we were lucky to have a great collection of bone tissues for the three predator species that were collected through three, from 1985 and 2007. That's amazing. That was like before Josh was born, you know? <laughs> And then, and then we have, we use prey sources that with help of a lot of local fishers. So we use muscle, muscle tissues of prey sources to use isotopic mixing models. And then we can include uh, both isotopic values of predators, of prey sources, and the discrimination factor. The problem is that this type of models, they cannot cope with too much information of the prey sources. And each of these species, they eat like 20 species of, of, of fish and the model cannot deal with that. So what we did is to, we use the summer content data. We select the most uh, common prey sources in their diet and we group them in ecological groups of cephalopods, pelagic and demersal species. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> Okay, so here we have the first results. We have three plots. The first one we have the the uh, isotopic mean source, of, uh, isotopic source mean values of the three dolphin species, and then we have the carbon values through time and nitrogen values through time. So let's go layer by layer so we can uh, see what we found here. Basically, the, the, we can see here in the first one is that the Franciscana is not using the same, the same areas or eating the same resources that both Guiana and Baronos dolphins, okay? And just so you know, Franciscana is a river dolphin and these two are both dolphinids. So they are more uh, similar than Franciscana and these two species, right? But these two are kind of overlapping their foraging habitats and their prey sources. What is interesting here is that both species live in the same bay, but they avoid each other. So Guiana dolphins live in the western portion of the bay and bottlenose dolphins live in the eastern portion of the bay. And we believe that this is uh, 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 to avoid competition by interference once that we already, not we, I was not there, but uh, people already observed several agonistic interactions between these two species. So it seems that they are avoiding each other. Okay, and this is what we can kind of see in the second plot, right? We can see that carbon values are increasing for Guiana dolphins and decreasing for bottlenose dolphins at the same time. So it looks like they change areas simultaneously. And this is true for the Guiana dolphins. We have studies that show that they change areas around 2000, 2005. So apparently bottlenose dolphins did the same thing to the other side. So they don't need to be together. And the Franciscana, it's okay. It's not even close. And that's fine for Franciscana dolphin. These animals are very threatened by bycatch fisheries and they don't need problem. They don't need to interact with these other two bigger, much larger species, right? So we can see that they are here and not overlapping their areas. 
And then the third one, what we can see is that even though we have a diet of diet variation in diet between the three, three species, they are consistent across years for each species. Okay, so then we did, uh, we built their eyes space with their ellipse areas. And what we can see is actually, actually a segregation with Franciscana dolphins isolated from a little, not, not totally segregated, but not overlapping that much as Guiana and bottlenose dolphin. And it looks like this is because they are eating prey sources that are, have decreased values of nitrogen. So they occupy lower trophic levels when compared to Franciscana dolphins. So in our group of prey sources, probably Franciscanas are eating uh, pelagic species that have higher nitrogen values, they are piscivorous, and the demersal species are more detritivorous, that's why they have lower nitrogen values. So we can see that Franciscana is isolated, these two are together and they are overlapping. And then we can see also that bottlenose dolphin has a larger ellipse area, and this is because we have two types of individuals in these populations. We have the resident uh, Lahil bottlenose dolphins that I know to uh, cooperate with local fishers and in a unique foraging paddock that where both uh, are fishing mullet species, right? But then we have the transient individuals that have to use a wider geographic areas and probably have access to different prey sources. So basically this wider niche is because we have a mixture of these two in this population. When we go to Guiana dolphins, we have a very restricted population of resident individuals that live together. And that's why they have the smaller niche areas. So they are restricted, avoiding bottlenose dolphins, and they are probably in a place where they have to eat similar resources. And when we have the output of the mixing waters that show us the contribution of the prey sources to the diet, that is exactly what it is. So we see that Franciscana dolphins are eating, eating mostly anchovies. That's why they are not even close of overlapping with Guiana and bottlenose dolphin. But these two here in the second plots, so the right is here. So Guiana dolphin and bottlenose dolphin are eating more demersal prey sources. Both of them eat a lot of mullet species. And for bottlenose dolphin, it's like most part of their diet, 72%. And we didn't know about this looking at their stomach content data, probably because when they eat these mullets, they have uh, the authority to digest more fa faster than the other species. And we cannot see this authority in the stomach content data. But because we are analyzing the assimilated diet, we know now the importance of mullet species to bottlenose dolphins. And here the problem start because Guiana dolphin loves mullets, bottlenose dolphin also love mullets, but this local community that lives in Southern Brazil also love mullets. And during the months of June, July and August, these people go crazy with the mullets. And what is happening is that South, the Santa Catarina states produce over more than 45% of the total landing of mullets in Southern Brazil. So this fishing, this fishing is unsustainable. And this uh, increase in fishery in the last years and the increase in the high contribution of this fishing, mullet species to both Guiana and bottlenose dolphins raises some concerns about the resource uh, use between these three sympatric, these two sympatric species with fishing activities. What will happen if the food becomes scarce? These individuals can start to competing more for resources and they are already really restricted, right? And what can change here is the level of interspecific and intraspecific competition for resources. And this is uh, complicated because these two uh, in components, they also interfere in the individual specialization in a population and in the trophic niche width of a population. That's a lot, right? Uh, so once we knew all of this about this population, that got me thinking, okay, we know all of this about this community of dolphins, about this Guiana dolphin population, but it's very specific situation, right? What if 
we try to understand the traffic niche of Vienna Dolphin in a more fine scale resolution. Instead of looking at these communities, the, tra the traffic niche as a whole, what if we break the traffic niche in different components and analyze Vienna Dolphins living in different conditions? So then we moved to my second question. I wanted to know how is the traffic level, uh, the traffic niche width of Guiana dolphin in different ecological contexts? So these animals are distributed from Honduras to southern Brazil, different ecological conditions. So uh, some of them, some of these populations live in single trees, some are, are alone. So how does affect their traffic niche width or basically their diet, right? Okay, so now we know a little bit about the Bahia North or North Bay population. Yes, they live in sympathy with two other species. They have around, uh, they have a population of 130 individuals and a group size of almost the same. And why is almost the same? Well, what happened in this population is also unique. They are not only restricted, but they are always together in a unique and stable group that lives together. And they are restricted using only a portion of bay. But when we go a little bit further, we have the Babitonga Bay population that lives in sympathy only with Franciscan dolphins. They have a group size of five to six individuals, very contrasting with this group size. And they are only resident individuals, around 200 individuals, and they use the bay but also areas outside the bay. And then we go a little bit further to Northeast of Brazil, a very, very warm place, sunny place, where, <laughs> where these Guiana dolphins don't have, uh, they don't coexist with any other dolphin species. Uh, very lucky, right? They live in a beautiful place, alone. Uh, so actually you can see dolphins there, of course, and other cetacean species, but we don't have any resident population in this Caravellas River. It's only the Guiana dolphins. But this is also a unique area. We have around 50, 55 to 124 resident and transient individuals. And this difference is because it's always a fluctuation uh, across years. And it's a very small number of individuals, solitary or two to three individuals foraging in a variety, in a mosaic of habits. So they use coral reefs, they use estuary mounts, and they use uh, the river. So these three populations uh, are usually classified as generalist and opportunistic foragers. What does that mean? So basically they, classify based on stomach content data, they classify the population as generalists with individuals that are also generalists in where each individual consume the same prey consumed by the population as a whole. So we are considering individuals here as the same, ecologically, ecologically similar. And we know that is not true, that we do, are different from each other, right? And the other thing here is that we cannot assess if an individual is a specialist or a generalist only through a snapshot, only to one moment. We need to know what they are eating through a period of time, and then we can know, oh, they are changing. They are consuming this, only this, or consuming more things. And especially, this become even uh, more uh, true because recent theories break, broke the traffic niche with in two different components. So now we have the traffic niche width and we have two components that form them. So we have the individual component. So we have the variation in the diet for one individual during the lifetime, plus the between individual component, what you eat and what I eat are different. So then you have your total niche width for your individual in relation to the total niche of a population, and this will give us the index of a specialization of a population. Uh, I hope you guys understand that. It's kind of, <laughs> I can see your face. It's kind of like, oh. So, so see, index, if it's close to zero, tell us that individuals are more 
specialists, but if it's close to one, individuals are more generalists. So now we can see the niche, the traffic niche of Vienna dolphins through the new, through this new spectrum that was never studied before. Okay, now it started to become really complicated. Um, we needed a temporal assessment of Vienna dolphins, and it is really hard to have stomach content of the same animal in different periods of time. It's impossible, right? Uh, so we decided to use metabolic inert tissues. At this point, I didn't know that I can use different tissues from the same individual. That would be a better idea in this case. And why that? Because again, a dolphin has a tiny little tooth. And to have a temporal analysis, I needed to drill these different growth layers because each growth layer represents one year, right? A really bad idea, but... <laughs> Uh, it took me almost two years to sample all the two samples that I needed, uh, four different labs in Brazil and the U.S. Uh, but it was, uh, we found different, very, very interesting results. So I'm thankful for doing that. So basically to have a longer temporal assessment, we needed to estimate the age of each individual to have only adult individuals, uh, six years or more. And then from this, we got samples from these individuals, we cut them, we accentuate their growth layers, and we drilled them using a micro mill, okay? And because the growth layers become even um, more aggregated close to the cavity, the pulp cavity, we have to group them in five tracks per two samples. That was a nightmare, just so you know. <laughs> So, well, this is a lot of things, a lot of complicated things together. So let's go uh, through layers. So what we have, oh, it's really high there. Okay. So what we have here, each one of these tracks represents one individual. So we have a lifetime of one individual. And we can see for the carbon is the same thing. So basically everything that we are going to say here is for nitrogen. For the carbon, they are the same, and that means that they are always using the same area. They are coastal. That is what we hope that they were doing. But for the nitrogen, we have different situations here. So the track lines for the North Bay, they're all grouped and they're constant. So basically, it seems that we have generalist individuals that are eating the same thing, right? In a group of individuals very aggregated into the same thing. This change for Babitonga Bay, we have, uh, they, more, they are more uh, separated. And here for Caravellas Bay, they are very separated. And when we go to the index that I mentioned before, we understand why. The index of specialization for Caravel is close to zero and for North Bay is close to one. So we have generalist individuals in the North Bay, but specialist individuals for the Babitonga and for Car Caravellas River, okay? Okay, the first part, check. And then we have this table here. And that is, I tried to put this in a nice way, but it's, it was really hard. But what I want to show here is the total niche width. And when we see the total niche width of the Caravellas River, it's like 1.5 compared to 0 0.3 of Guiana Dolphin. So the total niche width of the Caravellas Bay is huge. And then when we see the between individual component, we understand why because individuals are eating different things. There's a lot of differences between individuals, right? Compared to 0 0.09 to, uh, to the North Bay, right? Okay, let's see a better image of this. I think it's easier like this, right? So basically what we have in Caravellas River is the wider traffic niche. And when we look at this, we say, oh, this population is generalist. But now we understand that populations of generalist individuals can have can be composed of specialist individuals. And the total niche width becomes wider because of the difference between individuals, right? So that probably is happening because these individuals have low inter and intraspecific competition. They walk, they walk, no, they swim. And <laughs> in small groups of two and three individuals, they don't coexist with any other species there. So they are free to eat whatever, you know? But when we go to Babitonga Bay, we have an intermediate niche 
where we also have specific individuals, but the total niche width is different. So it seems that they are still restricted, and this is probably because they have Franciscan adults there. And then we have the other stream that is our unique population in North Bay, where the total, total niche width is very small, and there is no difference between individuals. So that makes the niche be small, right? We don't have, we are all restricted in the same place, eating the same things. So probably because of the high inter and interspecific competition. So that brings that topic of, well, generalist populations can be composed of generalist individuals or specialist individuals. And then we have specialist populations composed of specialists. Okay, so we have this uh, idea of the traffic relationships using biomarkers to understand the traffic relationships between marine mammals, uh, how each the, the interactions between them can change their traffic um, their traffic niche. But there is also I was missing something here and something very important: the human component, right? How we can also affect the diet of marine mammals, and that brought me to a very unique case here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for uh, Bruce and for Daniel Palacios for the opportunity of being here today and to deal with this uh, such unique case and with valuable tissue of sperm whales. So this is my postdoc here. Uh, diving deeper into the deep water horizon oil spill because we want to understand how these affected sperm whales, Gulf of Mexico sperm whales. Okay, so just a background here. This uh, spill was the largest, is the largest oil spill into the sea. It happened at 1500 meters and it was more than 800 lit million liters of crude oil and more than 200 million liters of chemical dispersants that rapidly spread through the water column and settled down to the seafloor. It's a lot. So this toxic mixture affected the deep water in unprecedented ways, especially affecting the abundance, uh, abundance of the commercial megafauna. And many of these commercial organisms, they are important uh, prey sources for other large fish like sharks and also to other marine mammals. And there we have our star. Sperm whale, for example, they are deep diving species that eat mostly squids, mostly cephalopods. So in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a mixture of deep waters and nutrient rich uh, input of the Mississippi River that creates a productive pro 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 <laughs> environment for cephalopods that reflect a high occurrence of sperm whales living within and when, when near the area impacted by the oil spill. So this stock of 1600 individuals uh, is currently listed as a strategic stock due to impacts of historical, like the, the whaling and contemporary anthropogenic stressors. So the limited number of photo ID matches and the low uh, mitochondrial DNA haplotype diversity suggest that this is a nearly isolated population with minimal basin scales. So basically uh, what this is saying, altogether this is saying that even small ecological damages to their environment, their resources, or directly to this population can have serious implications. So what we know through passive acoustic monitoring after the oil spill bring us like uh, two uh, possibilities. One, these animals are using areas farther away from the oil spill, but also other studies are showing that actually what is happening is a cyclical occurrence probably related to oceanic processes rather than the oil spill per se. Well, Based on this, we still don't know what was the change to the habitat use and consequently to the diet. So our main question here was, how did the oil spill affected the habitat use and the, uh, the diet of Gulf of Mexico sperm whales? So 
So to answer this question, we need to compare the before and the after, right? In the ideal world, yes. But unfortunately, we couldn't have access to the tissues from before the oil spill. But after six months looking for, we found a report that had not only tagging data from these individuals, but also is a topic information from individuals' skin samples collected from 2002 to 2005. So these will be the, our pre-oil spill samples. And I was already really happy with that, but then we found also a report <laughs> with the prey sources and I was like, yay, mixing models. And then um, we have here at the marine mammal, we had, I use them all, but we had 30 samples of sperm wells collected by our team of researchers, right from the wet lab and other labs during 2011 to 2013. So these were my post oil spill samples. And these are very pre preliminary uh, results. I'm waiting them for come back to the field to see how we are going to combine this uh, isotopic research uh, data. So what we can see here is the first plot for the carbon. We have female and male between periods, pre and post oil spill. And we can see that there is not a lot of difference here, right? From before and after the oil spill. So that suggests that they are using the same areas from that they were using after before the oil spill. But the same is not true for the nitrogen. We can see here a variation for females, but a huge variation for males. That means that at some point here in a small scale, they are changing their prey consumption. So to understand it, to see, to use the mixing models, we again group the prey sources, the most uh, consumed prey sources in the diet, but now we group them by families and they uh, differ in the zone that they use and if they are migrators or not. So we use five families. Okay, so here we have plots in this row, we have female pre and post pill and males pre and post pill. So basically, the diet for both of them, uh, the, the prey sources don't change for both of them. What changes is the, prey, uh, the, country, the proportion of each one to the diet. But the most interesting thing here is that both of them decrease the consumption of empire squid. So females decrease 24 to 17 and males decrease 30 to 13%, much more than the females actually. And again, they increase together the consumption of histiotutis. Am I saying right? Histiotutis? Okay. So females increased 41 to 45, 46%, and males increased 26 to 35, 36%, sorry. So they decreased the same prey and they increased the, also the same prey sources. But so far, we have been talking only about, about bulk tissue as we analyze table isotopes in bulk skin samples. It, and this tissue includes uh, a mixture of different macromolecules. So we have lipids, we have fatty acids, we have protein, we have DNA. But what if we put a loop here and we analyze table isotopes in individual compounds, such as different amino acids that build our tissues, right? The protein that builds our tissues. So the advantage of doing that is that Stable isotopes, they behave differently in different amino acids. So in the case of nitrogen isotopes, they are classified in two types. So we have the source amino acids and we have the trophic amino acids. So if you look at this plot here, we have nitrogen isotopes in the, this X axis and the organisms feeding in the abbots in the X axis. So we have primary producers, herbivore and carnivore, right? And here you can see that the nitrogen values in the source and trophic amino acids in this organism. The nitrogen in source amino acids, they change very little at each trophic uh, step, while the nitrogen in trophic amino acids, they fractionate a lot each trophic level. So looking at that single sample of a consumer, we can have the information of the base of the food web with the source amino acid. And we can combine the information with the nitrogen isotopes in trophic 
uh, amino acids, and we can estimate the trophic position of these individuals. So, so this is the advantage here. In this plot, so here you can see the estimated trophic position of sperm whales based on the amino acid, amino acid data. In this plot, we can see the trophic position of females and males from the Gulf of Mexico, and the mean trophic position is very similar between sex. They range before 5.5 and 6.5 for both of them, but the mean values are almost the same for both of them. We want now to explore more this data and see if there is a difference between fem females, I don't know, maybe haplotypes or different groups, right? Okay, so this high consumption of esteotutis is not a, a novel um, behavior for sperm whales. It's something that is observed in different populations. And why is that? So this family of squids, they uh, have a uh, schooling behavior. They uh, live through the water column, but they concentrate in the mesopelagic zone. And as other deep water uh, squids, they have they acquire neutral buoyancy by uh, storing uh, ammonia in their body cavity. So that implies in the low calories, like they have low calorific content and they are very slow swimmers. So basically, uh, they are eating what is easy to eat there, right? This will save them, will facilitate as a strategic, a strategic foraging tactic that allow individuals to operate under tight energy budgets for example, during long dives, right? <clears throat> but why they increase the consumption of estiotitis? So what happened is that some studies have shown that the person, the person of lipids in these types of squids, they decrease after the oil spill. And what increased is the percentage of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. So what happened here is probably they have less lipid because of their diet, they decrease their dietary intake or because the quality of their food is not good anymore, right? So basically we believe that sperm whales are having to eat more ischiotutis because they have to obtain uh, more lipids from more individuals. And another possibility <clears throat> is that the increased consumption of ischiotutis may compensate the, the decrease in vampire squids. And why they're not eating vampire squids anymore? So there's a lot of, again, ecological conditions that um, probably these animals are more uh, exposed and more vulnerable to the oil spill. So basically they live right in the zone where the oil spill had happened and they are now migrators. So they have nowhere, no other place to go, right? So they were affected by this suspended oil spill, uh, oil plume. And the other thing is that they passively feed on the trital aggregation, so they might be eating this oil together with their food, and they have the lower metabolic rate from all squid uh, species. So basically, we have two options here. Either vampire squids are not abundant as they were before, or they, the high exposure also decreased their lipid content to a point where it is not more, it's not more benefic to sperm whales to dive deeper and to eat sources that don't have the same calories that they had before, right? They will spend a lot of energy and they will have to eat much more to, to have these calories again. So now we have this atopic data. We are still exploring more the amino acids. They are, they just, we just got this result like two weeks ago. But now we also want to put another component here. We want to combine these biomarkers with uh, satellite tracking data and maybe some diving profiles. So what we want to do here is instead of having the mixing models for groups of females and males before and after the oil spill, I want to see if individuals that travel more from the, from the oil spill area, if they are consuming more vampire squids, for example, because maybe vampire squids in other areas are more, I don't know, more interesting than the ones that are still in the area, right? Or maybe, no. So that's what I want to do in the, now have these associations with the, the distance travel and with the diving profile, because we also have some information that individuals are not performing the benthic dive that they were doing before. We also have hormone analysis, mostly because we wanted to know how the diet, the change in diet 
affected the physiology of this organ. So we have here information for stress levels and reprodu the reproduction. Unfortunately, we couldn't access uh, the before the oil spill to have a comparison, but we are still looking for this. Okay, so we saw marine mammals interacting, humans interacting with the diet of marine mammals, but how marine mammals also affect the diet of humans, right? So he, this is a new and very cool project that I'm very glad to be part of. Uh, this is an integration between a lot of cool, cool people here. So we have Jean Bryce, um, we have our young Josh Stewart, uh, we have a lot of cool people from NOAA that have been working with salmons uh, in this year. So yeah, uh, I, I don't have a lot to talk about this project yet because I will start in two days, but, <laughs> but I'm very excited to be part of the lab and to, to start a new project. It will be my first project with Finiped, so uh, I'm very excited. So what we are going to do, oops, that is Tofu, it's my cat. I needed to put him here. Because as Kyle said, we don't need reasons to put our cats in presentations, right? And he eats like a harbor seal and he loves salmon. So I just thought that maybe I can do some analysis on him. So basically, this is what I'm going to, we are going to do. So much of the research has focused in how harbor seals consume adult salmon, but the mortality of salmon smolts is also very huge, right? We have very high mortality for salmon smolts. So we want to understand, we will subsample whiskers of harbor seal to understand how the diet of, of adult individuals are changing through time, through seasons, and through their lifetime. And we want to understand this with other factors like pinnipeds abundance, salmon abundance, and yeah. And we also want to compare other species. We want to see other than salmon, how much sardine and chauvet they're eating, so smaller species. And for this, we're going to use carbon and nitrogen. But here's the thing, sardine and anchovy animals that have the same, that live in same areas or eat the same things, they will probably have same isotopic, similar isotopic values. And the use of carbon and nitrogen cannot give us some time to answer that we want. What we can do is implement, complement with another element. And here we can use sulfur. So we have a gradient of sulfur from freshwater environments to uh, marine environments. And we hope to see different uh, levels of sulfur in animals that are eating salmon smolts compared to animals that are not eating salmon smolts. And what I just think here that what we can do also, I have to talk, Josh, if you're watching this, this is a good idea. Uh, what we can do here is see if there's an individual variation, right? Individuals that are eating more salmon smolts compared to others that are not maybe males are eating more salmon smolts compared to females. I don't know, something that we can use in the future. Anyway, um, I would like to thank a lot of different groups of labs of fellowships that allow me to be here today. Uh, Josh for the opportunity of being in his lab, Daniel Palacios and Bruce, uh, Lisa for being, for allowing me to be here today. And the license plate, the gray whale license plate for, uh, anyway, for all the, for all this cool data that we are working with. And I would like to thank you all, obrigada for coming. Uh, thank you for all the support you gave me this week. Thank you, Ultra Life friends, uh, for my colored cookies and, <laughs> And thank you all for being here. I'll be, question, I'll be answering any question you may have now. All right, uh, who would like to ask first question? Hello, awesome Hi. talk, Clarissa. That was, that was really you. cool to see. Um, I was wondering if there's any um, documented consequences of the shift in diet by the sperm whales. I'm thinking things like lower reproductive rate or smaller morphology or lower body condition. Yes, actually what we know about, that's why I decided to make, uh, to, to go for the hormone analysis in sperm whales, because there's a lot of studies for bottlenose dolphins from Florida, 
showing, I think is Barataria, uh, something like that thing. Yeah. Some of these animals are having like decreased levels of reproductive hormones and they are having a, a smaller body dimension. So that got me thinking, okay, what is happening with other species, right? So yeah, it might have any possi different possibilities for them. That's what we want to see. Thanks. Do we have any questions online? Any more questions inside? Oh, it's about tofu. Uh, yeah, I can actually talk about my cat too. So, <laughs> um, I love that talk, and I really don't get stable isotopes. So, great job. Um, I'm actually curious uh, on the thing that you're going to be starting with <clears throat> the harbor seals. You said you're going to be using whiskers. Yes. How long does it take to actually grow the whiskers? In other words, what sort of time frame or what sort of dietary time frame are you going to be able to parse out from that from so the tissue it depends for each species of us uh, of pinnipeds so it depends on the growth rate of each species and i know that for harbor seal is very complicated i wish that keith was here to answer this question actually <laughs> i'm not sure yet but you have uh i think you have a resolution of maybe i don't know months to one year it's not that much okay yeah i was trying to think i mean Trying to figure out how fast Walter grows his whiskers. <laughs> so I was trying to see if it was we can like, test. Yeah, that was what I have. So. I'm, we can test. I'm crazy to test hydrogen in my in tofu and beluga to see like if oh I my can God, we could see the signal from Brazil and from here. But anyway, this is just an idea. It's a great idea. <laughs> it's a particular project. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions online or in the room? Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Please join me in thanking our speaker today. If you haven't signed in, please sign out. Mm.